Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about preserving landscapes, large pieces of land in order to conserve. Uh, when we're talking about conservation biology, historically, you have to understand most of the efforts were in the past to try to save individual species, and it seemed logical to do so. But the more we've studied it, the more we've learned that really the goal should be larger than that because we need to be able to preserve, and it makes good sense, the whole landscape, the whole habitat, the whole region that the organism lives in, and thus you save the organism because it's a lot more complex than just saving individual species. There's community and reliance, and so they really need a lot of space. And so ultimately, <clears throat> this is a conversation about preserving large landscape biodiversity or ecosystem biodiversity. So one of the things of consideration is that when a habitat is is injured in some way, like maybe there's some logging done, what what occurs is that there's an edge. Can you notice here that there's an edge between this area, which is different than this area? This is a lot more wooded area here. This region around the wooded areas is referred to as the edge. And the edge is an area where the inside is a little bit more vulnerable. Like in other words, if I were to, let, let's go to the next slide. Like for example, here's a real dramatic edge. And so as it turns out that when you, when you create an edge, it provides an opportunity for organisms to like enter into this, into the interior that wouldn't otherwise. And so also the, the environment like it could be like pathogens or some sort of predator that wouldn't be able to make its way in. Also, the, the environment is a little bit different over here. These or This part of the, of the community is vulnerable to like maybe too much exposure to sunlight or too much wind or what have you. And so the more edge, the sometimes it's a trade-off. Some species actually prefer edge, but overall it's not very good. And so you get more edge the more fragmented it becomes. Like for example, let me see if I can illustrate this. Like for example, if you had, so if you had, for example, a plot of land like this, and this is one given area, but if you start to cut it up into pieces like this, and you get smaller sized regions, do you notice here that there's more edge in these smaller plots than there is in one continuous spot? And so it's, it's sort of the, the notion of uh, three small cells have more surface area than one large cell. And so, in fact, more things can interact with that smaller plot of land, and that's not always a good idea. So you want to keep, for one thing, the landscape intact. And when you create these like roads, for example, if you're coming in and you're logging an area, this basically provides a trail for, you know, unwanted organisms to come in. And, and then, you know, furthermore, there's a lot more light and that organisms are adapted to sort of this isolation. And so overall diseases can come in and there can be difficulties due to fragmentation. And depending on the organism, sometimes these barriers, this separating this area from this area, this, this geographic barrier, um, can be now a road doesn't seem very much, but sometimes these the the barriers could be really large. You could actually prevent uh, gene flow from occurring from one population to the other population, and then you get genetic isolation occurring. And so, an example of that is in California. For example, the redwood forest, the coastal redwood forest, used to be its its natural habitat is that it was one continuous forest all along, but since logging has occurred, it's been fragmented into these smaller groves. Now, you would think that these areas are protected because some of them are like Redwood National Park and uh, Jedediah Smith State Park. Here's Redwood Park here. Now, these are great locations, but the, the truth of it is that they're separate from one another, and so there's not enough gene flow occurring. And so basically, these are like islands due to fragmentation and these small islands can become inbred and again small populations um, maybe the 
maybe that something's wrong with some of those trees and therefore those get passed on. Recessive alleles can get passed on. Genetic drift is occurring, so a small population size changes the allele frequency. And thus, these populations are vulnerable to extinction vortex because of their fragmentation. And also, there's, you've created a lot of edge. And so you've got a lot of opportunity for things to damage coming in from all the sides, like this. And so one of the ways in which uh, conservation biologists try to attempt to solve this is if there's some development that's planned in an area, and we know that we have to cut off this one patch of area from another area, maybe it's incumbent upon the, the group that's doing the development to actually establish a movement corridor. I know it sometimes movement, movement corridors are naturally occurring, but sometimes they're artificial. And this would allow not just for people to travel, but it would allow for animals to be able to move back and forth. I know that sounds a little silly, but it could literally allow gene flow to continue to occur and so that the populations aren't isolated from one another. And an example of this is a, uh, a rather large hotel in uh, just outside of Yosemite National Park. It's called the Evergreen Lodge. And so there's a lot of development, as you can see here. But they've tried to take into consideration these uh, movement corridors. You see all this little area right here it literally says open space corridor. And so instead of just building and building and building, they're trying to allow natural flow of organisms to be able to move back and forth to do what they're trying to do. And so it's trying to coexist with nature and development. So one of the challenges that conservation biologists faced is trying to set up protected areas. I mean, they could be national parks, but they could be state parks. They could just be called protected areas or reserves uh, because they're very, very valuable. So these are hot spots of biodiversity. And so the government has set aside about 77%, I'm sorry, of the world's land uh, for various types of reserves, which is very impressive. I mean, we would always want more, but it, thank goodness we have that. And so what areas are we really most interested in? Again, the tropical rainforests are very important, chaparral, and uh, also the coral reefs are very important. Here in the state of California, the University of California has set aside some areas called reserves. And so these are not technically national parks or state parks, but they're reserves. And what the university uses them for are basically living classrooms where groups of students can go and visit pristine areas. If you want to visit those locations, you can check out this website. Um, it's, it's a real noble uh, cause to be able to do that. But one of the challenges is, you know, like just because you have this wonderful Yellowstone National Park and this great Grand Teton National Park. And you're like, well, gee, all the organisms, the bears are saved in here. The truth is that the, the, the real boundary for bears is beyond the park border. And so really what you want to do is preserve a larger area, the most area that you possibly can. Likewise, wolves can travel in and out. And so the, the actual biotic boundary is larger than sort of the legal boundary and so you get into conflict this way and so this is a uh, this is a concern and so one way around this is that some countries have adopted something called zone reserves and so it's a really interesting thing if for example if there's a a, a region like for example the tropical rainforest in the country of costa rica some of that rainforest is really, really sensitive and it's really important to preserve it. And so you're going to have to have a little bit of a balance between ecotourism and the, the uses of some of the things that we need in the rainforest. And so one of the, the ideas is to try to create a region around the, the most sensitive area. Let me show you in this diagram right here. So these areas in green are the most sensitive areas that you want to keep completely pristine. And so you don't want any humans, basically, there are as few as possible entering into those areas. And so what Costa Rica has done is they've tried to create like this yellow area, which is this zoned um, reserves, which they will allow tourists to visit and 
be able to interact with those areas. And so the hope is that those areas provide a buffer which will prevent the destruction of the more pristine areas. And so we can keep those areas as natural and as wilderness as possible. And it's a real model. So Costa Rica takes this approach that they want to maintain their tropical rainforest and they want to sustain it for decades and decades by managing it properly instead of thinking short term profit in terms of cutting it down they'd rather keep it for long term use and but in order to have long term use you have to buffer it with these uh, with these zoned areas and so one of the things um, that I also want to discuss is that sometimes areas um, have been hurt, if you will, by human involvement, whether it be um, military bases that, re that have been removed or an, or an area has been logged or there's been some abandoned human es establishment of some kind, like some farming area, and you want to restore it. Well, Nature normally restores itself through ecological succession, like when a fire comes by, things take care of themselves. But humans, if we were by the hand of, of causing the disruption, we should be part of, the, part of the recovery as well. And so there's a branch of ecology called restoration ecology. And the, the goal here is to restore habitat that's been harmed in some way by some kind of human disturbance. And so the park service is involved with this. There's many organizations. And so some real clever stuff. I just want to give you an example of this. And like, for example, if there's uh, train stations or military in installations that were using like heavy metals, for example, some sort of toxic that got into the soil, we're starting to discover that there are certain plants species that can actually be grown in those areas and they actually take up those heavy metals and they can tolerate it and they actually help to detoxify the, the soil after a prolonged period of time in a polluted ecosystem and so we call this bioremediation it's pretty cool that we're actually using our knowledge of of organisms to sort of restore the environment back to its normal condition and so there's a whole initiative <clears throat> called Sustainable Biosphere Initiative, which is a, a sort of a research institution that's supported by the Ecological Society of America that tries to manage areas. And, and the goal is that when, you know, development's going to occur, but it needs to be sustainable. And so whenever we're trying to make decisions about whether or not this new development, this new mall, this new housing uh, development can come, it, it, we really have to slow it down and look at all the possible um, outcomes to the habitat, to what what plants and animals are living there. And it's a trade-off. And sometimes it comes down to really just what is our what is our core value? How much do we value biodiversity? How much do we really, because it's difficult to have self-restraint. This is what we're talking about. Like we have the ability to continue to develop but we have to stop because it may not be the right thing to do. And it really comes down to morals and values. And so that's why it's really important to consider what is the right thing to do when you're talking about conservation biology. And I think inside all of us, we have this love of biology. It's sometimes called biophilia. We all know that we love nature. We all have that intrinsically within us. I'm not sure if there's a gene in our, in our, uh, DNA for this, but certainly many people enjoy nature. And though we may not live in a wild environment, we may not even visit it, it's good to know that it's there. And so there's something about nature that, that is rejuvenating and it can restore us. And so this sense of biophilia is something that's been within us for a long time. I mean, you can go back to the ancient cave drawings and it's like, you know, why you know, this is a profound question, perhaps, but why were people drawing on the side of caves and drawing it so beautifully? And it's like, it's not, it's not, art is not necessarily practical. It's, it's showing a love. It's trying to communicate importance. And so I think within all of us, we want to pres preserve these pristine landscapes for future generations to enjoy. And so in the end, maybe we're motivated 
not by economics. Maybe we're not motivated even by the, the medicines that can come from biodiversity, but maybe it's just truly the love that motivates us. And I'm sorry for sounding silly, but in the end, it's not just because it's, you know, that we depend on nature, because, but it's because it's the right thing to do. This is why we save it, because it's the right thing to do. And we, and we try to protect it, not because it's easy to protect, because it's hard to protect. So it's a challenge and we're up, we're up for it. And so together, we could work collectively and preserve and protect nature for all to enjoy for, for the end of time. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that brief video on conservation biology and on a landscape level. Thanks for watching.